This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Happy Friday, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the long table. I'm uh, happy to introduce our speaker today, who is Professor Lucia Travaini, who is a professor of medieval and modern numismatics at the University of Milan. Um, and among other honors, in 2012, she received the Medal of the Royal Numismatic Society, which is, of course, a very high honor in the field of numismatics. Um, and she's talking today about uh, medieval relics, uh, the 30 pieces of silver in particular, coins as, as relics, uh, which is a really interesting topic. And uh, here at the ANS, I, I don't think we have the English version yet, but we have the Italian version. Uh, here at the ANS, at the ANS Library, and uh, she's also shared with us a discount code for the English uh, version, so I just put this link in the chat if you're interested in buying Professor Travaini's book. Um, you can get a 20% discount with code EFL02, and again, I just dropped that in the chat. So, um, Professor Travaini, if you'd uh, like to go ahead and get started, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm grateful for your invitation. And um, thank you, Emma, for helping me with showing the images. <laughs> um, what I would like to, to point um, in the first place is that I'm not a classicist. I am a medievalist, uh, trained as an archaeologist, and the first job which I found when I graduated was cataloging medieval coins in Rome in the National Museum when there were no experts on medieval coins. And so, well, I started, I abandoned my deserted villages and castles near Rome and I decided that coins, medieval coins needed to be studied. Next step was finding the good um, master to teach me and I discovered that there was Philip Grayson in Cambridge. So I started to write to him. He became my um, corresponding professor. And then in 1992, I went to Cambridge to work with him for six years before coming to Milan teaching. I say this because of course, the 30 pieces of silver are related to uh, ancient numismatics and uh, for that, uh, of course, I relied uh, on, on the, the works by, by Heim Gietler, especially. Um, but let's start with the 30 pieces of silver as relics in medieval and modern Europe. What we have here, we start, the 30 pieces of silver probably represent the most famous and infamous transaction of Western history, probably, and um, Judas was responsible for this. And what appears, what the Middle Ages did of Judas and the 30 pieces is writing hagiography, writing stories that, in a way, transformed the coins in relics and made the, um, the action of Judas something um, very interesting. In medieval geography, we find that Judas had a um, um, biography um, similar to that, to, to that of Oedipus without salvation though, but there was um, a, a story told about his started, uh, son, uh, a weekly rest that Christ um, granted to him for some kind of having done something good. So he spent his day of rest, uh, not in hell, but in other punishments. And then, uh, Emma, please, the next uh, step is how I got here. This is the books, the translation, and the fact that the next, please, um, 
is that um, I am Emma, please, I'm sorry to bother you all the time. And um, how I started to look up for these coins. My research on medieval coins started with catalogs of coin hoards. Then uh, I did some work on coins in written sources in arithmetical books. Uh, and then mint organization, iconography coins as identity. And then, of course, you find that some coins were not used for human transactions, but they were deposited into graves, into saints' graves. And then you start to, to, to explore the mentality and um, ritual uh, use uh, and devotional use of coins in the Middle Ages. Next um, image is asking uh, us questions. So we have to deal with the history of Christian materiality and relics, early Christian texts, hagiography. To write in this book, I, I did read diaries of many pilgrims, especially of the 50, late 15th century to the Holy Land, who described the specimen in the island of Rhodes, and then the history of the Jews, because of course, the more specimens of the 30 pieces were revered in churches, the more the Jews were um, accused of their side. And, um, and then of course, because most of these 30 pieces of silver recovered, inventoried, were Greek coins, we have to ask, how did medieval people look at these Greek coins? And then the great majority are coins of road. And here I have to thank again and again, Richard Ashton, because he gave me an, an enormous help in dealing with, with the coins, which I, you know, came to find, and he was also quite amused by what was surfacing from my research. And then, you know, antiquarian studies, and then also confessional history. Here, here I, I, I would like to, to point to you, because I, as a Catholic in, in Italy, I became aware of confessional, confessional history when I worked in Cambridge and realized that, of course, uh, whatever dealt with relics, um, pilgrims, indulgences, was papist, was something that was wrong. And um, so relics, of course, do not belong to, to the Protestant way of thinking. You don't see them in Protestant churches, but before being Protestant, they all had relics and they were very pleased to get indulgences. So this is what we see from pilgrim diaries, uh, going to the Holy Land from Germany, from other areas, all very happy to be there to see the relics and to, to go on with the devotional life. The next, please, Emma, is um, something to show how uh, coins were perceived in much of uh, medieval uh, um, thought. Uh, coins were bad for the soul. So we see many images of hell uh, with money bags at the, at the neck of various uh, people who had been um, accused of um, being um, greedy. And then Judas, as you see this fresco of the 15th century, in, this, in the moment when, as we know from the gospel, what will you give me if I will deliver him, uh, if I deliver you uh, Christ? And then 
take 30 pieces. So how uh, does it come that Judas is so renowned for being so greedy and interested in money? He's a very incompetent merchant because he said, okay, 30 pieces is fine. He didn't say, oh no, give me 40 or give me more. Or let... There was no contraction, to, no, I forgot the word. Anyway, he didn't ask for more and he got the 30 pieces. The next, please. Um, so coins in medieval and modern religious life were present in a way that was um, not, uh, um, had not surfaced before, uh, I can say, before I really did um, work on that in a totally large um, approach, bothering church historians, not just doing um, uh, the archeological and numismatic work. And, and so, um, we find coins in the foundation of buildings like Siena, deposited by pilgrims on altars, inserted by pilgrims inside this reliquary. This is a Santiago of Compostela head of, of Santiago in the, in the grave of even St. Francis of Assisi. And then here you see this, this, the, this is a, a natural mummy of a saint in Lucca, Santa Zita and um, died in 1278. And recently there were X-rays uh, of, uh, of this mummy and the, 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 they discovered that there is a coin placed in the mouth. So we don't know what coin it is because they could not destroy the head, but there is a coin in, in the mouth of this lady 1278 and this is no way similar there are no other um, cases in that period of coins in the mouth of, of, a, of a dead person so this is we need to be open to new and new and new discoveries emma please uh, this is how we we have to, to consider coins were not only a bad thing as they, uh, as church historians who ignore the archeological evidence were tempted to, to think. Coins were also a good thing if they were used uh, for arms, for, many other good action and deposited into the into the grave even of St. Francis of Assisi who had ordered the friars not to touch even a single penny. The next please and here um, we have the, the, the gospel of Matthew which is the one with more more uh, details on the money so Judas received the coins, the good silver coins, these uh, um, coins of, of Tyrus, I think you say Tyrus, uh, Syrian drachm, and uh, the, the best uh, silver coins at that time, so identified by Han Gitler. And uh, when he repented, brought the coins back to the priest and say, I'm sorry, I betray innocent blood. And they said, we don't want to, to know anything about it. He cast down the, the, the pieces and departed and hanged himself. What the chief priest did, ha, ah, this is not good. Money to go back in our treasury because it's the price of blood. So this is a situation in which we see the hypocrisy of money. Money is laundered all the time in our society, but money stained with sacred blood cannot really be used. And it, it was not 
uh, put back in the treasury, but was used to buy the potter's field. And uh, this, you know, it's, it's a very strong image. If you can think of Lady Macbeth, when, when she tries to wash her hands, to say, out done spot, out I say, and also she cannot wash the, the, her hands. Uh, the next, please, Emma, uh, will uh, show us the medieval legend of the 30 pieces. According to them, the coins were first minted by Abraham's father um, to purchase the field of uh, of Mabella to, to Barry Sarah were used in all major biblical transactions. So somehow they got to the key, to the three kings who donated to the Virgin Mary and she lost the coins when she went to e when they went to Egypt. The coins were found by a shepherd who somehow offered to Jesus and he said, oh no, give it to the temple. And this is how they went to Judas. This is marvelous. And um, we have to take it as, as it is. They did not ask many questions about typology of coins and the, the silver and the gold, the gold of the three kings. Well, never, never mind. This is how this legend was known. It is known in Latin and in many vernacular edition, old English, old German, old Catalan, old Italian. So this story was known. The next slide, please, is um, an image, uh, an early Christian image of, um, this is an ivory in the British Museum, and you see Judas hanging with the, the coins at his feet and the, also it may be interesting to know that the Judas hanging is the first representation of hanging in history because there are no similar scenes in classical art. Um, the next image will um, show how uh, all objects and events that were part of the Passion of Christ became relics as instruments of the Passion. This is a, a, a type of image which is called Imago Pietatis, the image of the, the man of sorrows, sur surrounded by, uh, by Mary and, and John and two other saints, but then there are all the instruments of the passion depicted and eventually the, the key scene um, uh, of, of Jesus by Judas to the right, the, 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 the crown of thorns, the nails, and all the other parts. And to the left, you see the cock that um, uh, sang after Peter denied uh, uh, Christ three times. And um, this cock was absolutely so ever present that there was even one church where one feather of this cock was preserved. So um, let's stay uh, on the 30 pieces. You see in this image, which is uh, Italian, uh, the 30 pieces are always represented as a transaction taking place. Coins pass in hands. And um, the, the next image, we can see how this um, um, is again uh, shown in, um, in, in other two, two more Italian paintings. The one to the right is um, an indulgent uh, panel where 
it actually gives uh, if, if you recite a pater noster and etc etc you will gain 21,000 years and, and 36 days this is um, what what we we shall see even north of the Alps the next slide will show how uh, north of the Alps these scenes with uh, the instruments of the passion uh, have the, the 30 pieces displayed so there is, there is no transaction in place but they were all represented in rows all 30 of them and um, some scholars have um, suggested that uh, this was uh, meant to um, have people counting them all and meditating on the bad action uh, of counting money and things like that. Um, having said that, uh, when you consider how small these images were and how far away were they were from normal people, I, I think I wrote it down in the book that probably the, the, the only person who actually meditated was the painter. But anyway, next slide, please, Emma, is uh, another of these paintings now in Barcelona. Uh, they are the coins that they look like medieval coins. Uh, there is no attempt to imagine them as ancient coins. And to the left, down we have um, a, um, an indulgent, in, 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 in indulgent, no, I don't know how to pronounce that, in, in England, that was where the, the, the years of, um, of pardon, of indulgence, had been crossed out after the Reformation. But it's good that this um, print was preserved. In the next slide, uh, we see a, actually a painting in Berlin where the painter reproduced details of current coins, current German coins. Uh, some others were probably invented, um, but again, they are all um, represented, all 30 of them. And this is um, a different representation with uh, also for the previous one of the mass of Saint Gregory uh, who had the appearance of Christ during mass. In the next, uh, in the next image, we have to ask what sort of coins were they? Um, so starting from the one of the uh, of the text that this describe this medieval legend of the 30 pieces from the time of Abraham's father. He concludes, it, and he, he wrote this story in, this, in his uh, book on the history of the three kings. He concludes in saying that on one side, the coins bear the head of the king, on the, on, on the other, Chaldean letters which the modern people are no longer able to read. Chaldeans were those who did magic. So letters that could not be read. Interesting thing is that there must have been a head, but it doesn't comment on the silver gold um, changes uh, in the long history of this uh, legend. In the next slide, I have shown the, the fruit of my research. So this is the inventory part. So the, in this book that was published 2020, there are 47 sites where one specimen of the 30 was or had been or was said to have been. Six are not related. There were wrong um, descriptions. One is a very interesting one. One is a place near Milan. Um, I found a, a notice in the 
pastoral visit of the bishop in around 1600, where in the inventory of relics of this small church, uh, there is a sample of the earth of the potter's field. So I said, the first time I read that, oh, what imposters. I, uh, they did not have a specimen of the coin and they put a piece of earth to say that this is sacred because it was bought with the 30 pieces. But I was wrong to think that that was an imposter. I mean, it's all an imposter, but, but in the medieval mentality and oh, still in 1600, people knew of the potter's field as the most holy place. And Felix Fabri was a pilgrim uh, from Switzerland who wrote in 1495. He writes extremely moving words about this potter's field where foreigners were buried. So also the pilgrims who died there were buried. And he, he writes, I would love to be buried here because you know, I, I would not go on. But all that was related to the Holy Land was holy. And there are 40 valid sites, 35 are single specimens, and then there are five which exaggerate. At Bologna, the altar of a church, of the new church. In Catalonia, there were two in this small place. In Malta, three. At Soissons, three. At Valencia, two. So, the total recorded 44, uh, and among which I will not, um, you know, go uh, go on. Ooh. And um, uh, anyway, 30 of these are Greek coins, and uh, Decadram of Syracuse is the most spectacular, but the most of them. 27 coins of road. Next slide, please. This is the way the, 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 the location is scattered, including Uppsala in Sweden, which had one in the 18th century. Next slide, again. Um, this is the first materialized specimen of the 30 pieces. Um, it is now in the Limerick Museum uh, in Ireland, in the Hunt Museum Limerick, Ireland. And this is marvelous. We know when it was transformed into a relic because the person who found this incredible coin, over 40 grams of silver, probably the most beautiful coin ever, did um, have it mounted in a gold frame. And the gold frame with the inscription, quia precium sanguinis est, because this is the, the, the price of blood. And by the form of the epigraphy of the inscription, the letters, we can date it between the, uh, around 1300 a few years before, a few years later, 1300, this became the first specimen of the 30 pieces. It must have been found not far from Syracuse in the area of the Strait of Messina, not too far away from there. Where it was kept, we don't know, it surfaced in, a, in an auction catalog and then uh, happily it is again in a safe place in Limerick. In the next slide, we see uh, the island of Rhodes, where, according to many pilgrim diaries, um, we, we, uh, we find the first uh, specimen. Now, in, until 1395, uh, the, 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 chapel, uh, the, the chapel of relics in, in, uh, in the church of the, of the Knights of Rhodes had 
a gold coin of St. Helena, that was a Byzantine coin, that was venerated, we have venerated all over these medals of St. Helena, Byzantine coins. Uh, during the liturgy of Good Friday, they made the cast uh, to distribute to the attending uh, people. In the same year, next slide, please. In the same year, uh, pilg uh, 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 the Italian pilgrim writes that he saw in Rhodes um, one, the, thir the, the 30 pieces. We, he does not describe it. The first description is uh, in 1413. He writes, it describes exactly um, a coin uh, of Rhodes. Although we cannot say whether it was um, a tetradrach or a didram. So I put this image with, uh, but it is um, my slide and the, the coin is lost. But uh, we know, for example, that this um, in between 1479 and 85, Johannes Struger of Nuremberg took a cast as he was there in Rhodes and he had many, many copies made to distribute to his friends. So many. So this is the magical life of coins, which can be reproduced by cast, counter cast. And uh, the, I really think that there must have been thousands of specimens of the 30 pieces all over Europe. And um, again, we know um, that um, the, the, the liturgy of Good Friday was celebrated with the distribution of, of cast of this new coin. Why did the, the Knights of Rhodes change the coins? Why did not keep their Medal of St. Helena? Because uh, by that time, by the late the 14th century, really saw um, a, a, a large, um, a larger diffusion of the devotion to to the Passion of Christ. So any relic uh, to be part of the of the story of the passion, any object of some kind was important to be kept as the um, as a relic. And in the, in the next slide, I, um, I I'm happy to show another existing specimen. This is this existed uh, was produced before 1412 because in 1412. Uh, is present in an inventory of relics of, of the church of Nin in Croatia. Uh, and uh, this is a didrachm of Rhodes. And uh, this, the, the reliquary altogether is a, a marvelous uh, thing. The drawing was, um, was done by, by a friend of mine. This is the, the, the image is very good that the keeper of the museum there um, gave me generously. And uh, in the next um, slide, we see um, one of these specimens, which is lost, um, I'm sorry to say, lost. We do not know what happened to this reliquary that was um, in Santa Croce in Jerusalem. This, this, this same cross, in Jerusalem, it's called like that. Was in Rome, was it's, it's called like that because Saint Helena, when she discovered the cross and the nails, she sent them to Rome, and she she wanted to build a church on this area, which is not far from Saint, Saint John the Lateran, was actually the property of Helena, and she took earth from Jerusalem to Rome 
in order to build this church to be called in Jerusalem. This is why. And anyway, this reliquary was, uh, we know this drawing thanks uh, to a scholar in the late 19th century. It was donated by Cardinal, uh, uh, who, a Spanish Cardinal who became titular of this church. And you see how it was uh, displayed. The, the drawing gives the, the side with the rows. The next slide will show the um, other specimen in Belgium and the drawing below, um, a specimen that was in La Spezia, which is lost. And uh, here probably we face um, identical coins, probably all produced by the same, um, the same original cast. It's, it is difficult to say. Um, but again, the one in Belgium um, was obtained in Rome. And we don't know exactly the next. Please, we... Echo here. <laughs> this is one of the specimens of the 30 pieces is a, a Mamluk dirham. And this was a surprise. They said, well, this is not possible. A Mamluk dirham in a cathedral in, in France. It is still there in the museum. And then I worked on these problems of how Arabic was perceived and um, merchants would go, would know what is a, an Arabic coin, but other people would not. And if you see to the left here, a detail of a painting, I think Gentile da Fabriano, um, decoration of the, of the nimbus and of the, the clothes, all the gold decoration, were inscribed in this in the 15th century frequently with Arabic inscription because this material came from the east, but the east was the holy land, and it is uh, quite likely that people would consider these letters to be ancient Hebrew script, ancient Jewish script. And uh, below we see a fault shekels because it's true most of the specimen which I recorded were from of, of Greek coins, but uh, a certain number were uh, shekels or imitations of Jewish shekels. And um, the one, the, the nine in Bologna now lost, were are said to have been shekels. The the next one, please, will. Um, sort of sh show how the connection came to the first antiquarian uh, who started to discuss but where these coins really relic, where coins of Rhodes to be accepted as probably really specimens of the 30 pieces. And there is on top an interesting a drawing of a coin that was in Paris and is unfortunately lost, where on the side with the head of Helios, there is the inscription Imago Cesaris. And this is uh, someone, and probably also in the Pilgrim's Diary, we can read that, they thought that the coins that were used as uh, um, 30 pieces of silver were of the same type as the tribute coin, where Christ, Christ was shown one of, the, one of these coins. And uh, uh, well, whose, whose image is that? That is the image of Caesar. So give, it, give them to Caesar. So, they were no antiquarians, these pilgrims uh, who went to the Holy Land. And the first antiquarian were Augustine 
who started to discuss the specimen in Rome. And he said, no, this must have been, this is not uh, 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 to be accepted as a relic because they must have been Jewish shekel. And then the specimen in Oviedo, documented from 1465, which is apparently lost, um, had another comment and the Morales wrote, oh no, not true. It's a coin of road, it's a coin of road, but uh, the 30 pieces must have been Roman coins. And anyway, um, in the in the 16th century, as you can see from this drawing, uh, the image of Judas is connected immediately with a coin of Rhodes, because that was what uh, was known to everybody that the coins of Rhodes uh, were 30 pieces. The next slide, please. Um, what I, I would like to say is that um, the Catholic um, keep, keep, keepers of these important uh, ch churches with relics like the Camara Santa in Oviedo and Santa Croce would, of course, not give up. They remain to be um, venerated as relics until quite recently. Uh, but the end of such relics was um, it is something which is interesting. It belonged to the history of research, the history of religion, and the history of thought. Uh, and, and then we, we can discuss at the very end the face of Christ on Rhodian, co on Rhodian coins, because some people thought that the face of Helios was actually perceived as the face of Christ by medieval people. Next image, please, is uh, this specimen, which discarded as false, false, as false relics, uh, together with this, a piece of the sponge that they had. So we, we are very, very sad to say that um, the one in Rome was discarded. We don't know where it is, but others, were put in museums. So there are two in Malta, um, in St. the Mamluk Diram, and Valencia, they had two, but during the, the, the war they lost one, they still keep, keep one. And they were very generous uh, to me with, uh, with the images, all three of these museums. In the next uh, image, I, um, would like to, to mention this. The face of Christ on Rhodian coins, a fine invention. No, but um, it is uh, true. I, it was, you know, I found it in uh, works by Ian Carradice, by um, Melville Jones, that, oh, yes, in the Middle Ages, um, uh, pe these uh, people thought that, uh, that they kept them as relics because they believed that the face, the, the face on one side was the head of Christ with the crown of thorns. It is fantastic that this was, um, uh, it is quoted like this by, by our classic, uh, classic colleagues. Uh, without quoting any source, it is uh, it, it is to discuss this with, with uh, Richard Ashton, who was uh, who was quite amused to to see that none of the ancient rite, none of the of these medieval pilgrims ever ever considered this head to be the face of Christ. There. Always, those who describe it describe the head 
of a young person. And there is a, a, actually one pilgrim who described it. Oh, this is a young head. He was thinking of, Ag of Augustus. So this is the, the, the young and strong beginning of the Roman Empire. So um, this is um, an invention of our, of our <laughs> contemporary colleagues that I am um, really able to, to discard as, um, as not a medieval fantasy, but as a, a numismatic fantasy of our days. And the next slide, I, I, I have a synthesis of, of this, but, but I would like to, to, to jump to the next one, Emma, please. And um, here um, we can, you know, at the end of this story, um, I, before discussing this, um, I, I like to, to say that in all the story of the 30 pieces, <clears throat> we know that these coins were used to pay the potter to buy the potter's field. So the potter must have must have done what he wanted with these coins. And so normally should not have been recovered. But because they existed from the time of Abraham and his father, they could they never been separated, always kept together. Of course, they were um, forever kept together. And in my book, there are 54. Uh, my conclusion is not so numismatic, but more um, generally on the meaning of money, money as measure, money as the price of price, money as the measure of his value. And this can be physically Imagine going into the church of St. John the Lateran, where in the cloister you have this monu monumental relic, which is the scribe. I tell you, we're 15 minutes out, so. Thank you. Um, the, the, in this inventory, 15, it is mentioned in 1297, but it is, uh, anyway, it's the the stone the square stone onto which the 30 pieces of silver were counted to Judas and this stone stands on four columns which were the the measurement of the height of our Lord Jesus Christ before he was crucified so and um, the measurement of these uh, the, the, the height of these uh, columns is actually used by painters like Piero della Francesca to uh, measure the, the, the to measure Christ in his paintings. So this is how this uh, all this story was so crucial for medieval and post medieval thought. And uh, in in the next one. I think that uh, I conclude because in my book I had 40, 54 and then uh, soon after the publication of the Italian book there was a man who, who is a, a great scholar of relics. Uh, first he, he, he told me that my book on relics was very good and never studied relics before so that was very important for me but he told me the story that um, of a specimen, now a, a specimen that was stolen in Rome during the sack of Rome, was brought to Milan, and this chap said, oh, it is like the one in the church of San Lorenzo in Milan. So there must have been one other in Rome, and then one more in Milan, 
And then he also uh, sent me a document where in, the, in another church in Rome, there was another one documented in the 18th century. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, yeah, as you say, said at the beginning, you know, in classical numismatics, there's been a lot of discussion on the 30 pieces of silver and what those were and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, it's not often that we think or, or certainly less often that we think about what people uh, later in the Middle Ages conceived of as the 30 pieces of silver. So this was a really interesting presentation. Um, I want to remind everyone that there's a link to the book in the chat if you would like to get the book. Otherwise, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Professor Travaini? No one? I'll ask a question. Um, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, the example of the Syracusan coin must have been found, you know, near near Syracuse. Um, but then you also have other examples where, you know, coins are very easily identifiable as much further afield from where they ended up. Have you, or, or would you be able to sort of map out, um, I guess, identifiable coins that would have almost ex in, in, the, in the kind of the Greek context been circulating in a very small kind of area but wound up much further away? Um, from my point of view, um, I, I, because the, 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 the specimen uh, of Syracuse has no story between how, when the coin was struck in the fifth century BC, when the inscription was made in 1300, and when it was sold in auction in Paris in 1878, we know nothing of where it was kept, mounted. Maybe somebody found it in Sicily and gave it to uh, an important person somewhere far away. We really don't know. But the coins of Rhodes, they are really they are not rare at all. They came from the East, they came from Rhodes, but pilgrims wanted them. Pilgrims went to, to see the relics and when they saw that there was one relic of that kind, but yeah, I didn't mention that. I think I discussed that at length in the book. The Knights of Rhodes, they must have, at least one of them must have um, had this marvelous idea to, to find one of the 30 pieces. And what did they look like? Let's make it look like one of the coins that we find here in Rhodes all the time, because hordes are very, are very numerous in Rhodes. And, and so they found out and they gave a specimen to their own churches in Paris, the temple, the, the, uh, the, the, to the hospitalia churches. And then there is the story of the casts and how they were reproduced. They, uh, the very specimen that was in Rhodes before they had to leave the island and then before going to Malta, we don't know. But in Malta again, they, in the, in the 18th century, when I recovered them uh, in, 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 in literature, and when they were described, that they, they had uh, still more specimens of roads as, um, as relics. But one in good condition, they kept it in the library. And two others, of which I have a photograph uh, reproduced in the book, they are in horrible condition and probably they are uh, copies themselves, but they are in such bad condition because all the time they were used to make wax, ca wax cast 
to give on Good Friday every year. It is amazing that these casts were known to be prodigious, to be able to make um, miracle healing. They were good for all sorts, all sorts of things. So, um, uh, quite frankly, it, it is always for me very important to talk to expert of ancient coins because you see the coins and you find the context in which your material is found. Then when you are visiting collection, you don't know where these coins come from. So for example, well, would Greek coins have been pierced? Would any of your Greek coins that you study in some cabinet have some kind of a reuse that may be a trace of some devotion? I really don't know. But why not? If that happened to, to the, the coin of Syracuse and so many of the Rhodian tetradrach, there was, I think, one or the other in Spain, in a small church near Toledo, was, um, uh, I think, a tetradrachm of Maroneia, which um, was there until the 18th century. In the 18th century, the, log the bishop went to this place and say, oh, this is no longer a relic. I will put it into my personal collection. <laughs> and he was a clever man, but we don't know where it ended up. But if it was kept with the relics, I wonder whether it had been put in a reliquary, whether it had been pierced, how it was uh, treated. So now, um, what the, it is very interesting that known of the specimen is a Roman coin. It is interesting. It may be at first sight surprising. Is it surprising? Roman coins were more or less in the 14th century when there was a peak of finding relics of the Passion of Christ. In the 14th century, in Italy, probably in France, Roman coins, when they were found, they were somehow identified as Roman. There was a, a head of someone who looked like, like an emperor who might have been in similar ways depicted or um, imagined on a building. And uh, in Italy, certainly they had an experience by the 14th century or earlier that in the ruins of Roman walls, you could find Roman coins. You had no idea of the period of the, but you would know what they would look like. But the 30 pieces must have been something very Eastern, very non-common. And non-common thing become relics, usually. Uh, th th this is how I see, I don't know. Uh, 